it's purely fascinating to teach the Winter Wind Etude by Chopin because it brings together the technique, the control, the shifting, the flexibility, the precision, define exactly for the piano technique which tendon muscle and shoulder, forearm, and to arm and wrist are involved in the production articulation of the notes. It comes through several practice techniques. The fact that in order to maintain the wrist untense, but the articulation of the fingers from a palm supported suspension, which is a strict muscular strengthening by practicing hold and poke, and not from the shoulders, arms, wrists, all that. In order to be able to last through the marathon of the etude, after a few bars, if you use for controlling the fingers articulation, dynamics and precision, the forearm, the tendon, the wrist, it's a problem. So you have to practice how to strengthen this. And this most important element in my teaching pianistic technique is that the palm support is where it's stiff, but the fingers at play, when they have to play fast arpeggiated patterns, chromatic like here, they have to be straight. I didn't say stiff, straight. So that knuckle to tip, they have no bending. The bending is perfect and necessary and mostly taught for children when they start. For the um, consecutive tones, a rounded hand, fingers. But when you have to play forte dynamic range and a lot of fast notes in broken intervals, you understand that here it's beyond a piece of music or an exercise of music for piano technique. It is Chopin's own idealization of what the technique of the fingers of the pianist and the hand of the pianist should be. Flexible and firm. Firm from the uh, palm upwards for the fingers and backwards free for the wrist so that you can try your best to break that palm support with the other hand to try but still at the same time maintain the wrist free not that you play with this style just to demonstrate it and why do I say that because I'm deeply convinced that the Cherny etudes were all about strengthening the fingers the hand from the original weak fingers because inevitably at birth we don't have strongly trained fingers to play the piano and um, jellyfish is more the way and so when the control of the fingers is not made by the palm support piloting and the fingers straight knuckle to tip then inevitably you have to compensate by stiffening the wrist the forearm into the shoulder and that cannot last. It can last perhaps a few bars, per page perhaps, of an etude. And the beauty about Chopin's etudes in terms of pianistic technique, just like the Debussy ones, is that they're not a composite of many types of technical um, arpeggios, repeated notes, octaves. Um, Liszt's etudes are really tone poems with technique, of course, like number 10. <laughs> But then you have, um, and then, alternative hands chords, then you have, uh, whenever in Chopin, like in Debussy etudes, it's one single topic for the whole etude. If it's a vertical articulation of right hand fast light notes, 
if it's the two hands, but throughout both and all. At least in the first etude opus 10, you have four octaves to be played the arpeggio to do this stretch and then retract. Stretch, retract. A bit like for the violinist, the right hand is the bow. He cannot play the bow with a stiff wrist, because he'll be choppy. And the left hand plays the articulation of the note. So the difficulty there is the coordination. In the piano, we have both in the same hand. The palm forward is the articulation, the left hand of the violin. And the wrist then becomes the flow, like on the horizontal side of the keyboard playing, um, is the flow. So, for instance, um, when you play the wrist is pulling slowly and horizontally down. I would say the fingers articulate from the palm. The wrist remains free without to agitate itself, just for the demonstration, but not. And then you have to still bring out the top notes, which are the chromatic descending scale of this enormous lament where um, it's easier to play, or intuitively easier to play louder, the naturally heavier fingers, thumb and second, the thumb being, in this case, horizontal. But when you play two and one loud, then you have to over scream the weak fingers five, four to make it up. But if you play soft, precise, two, one, then you can bring out the top without to overstate the weight because you have to last. And when you play the arpeggio up compared to the chromatic descent, you have two different energies, so therefore the wrist should rise to the top with the arpeggio. And then have the hand have a little bit for the wrist um, 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 turning so that when you play the descent you have enough by pulling the hand towards the thumb down you rotate it so that your weak fingers can project by lifting and playing precisely Especially because most of them play on white keys, the fewer the black keys, but nevertheless you have to adjust for each disposition by groups of five fingers by beat of broken intervals. It's in one, and then so. And so I believe very much that not only is important to picture how to make it technically, but you have to try it. If you preside, uh, you preside over your right hand with a left hand imaginary keyboard, and then every beat you have a different disposition of the notes according to the white and black keys, so that when you return it to play it, your fingers, in terms of the palm support, organize the knuckles directions all apparent, not broken under, that corresponds to the topography of the terrain of each beat, which your muscular memory has to memorize because in real time you cannot adjust it as it goes, it's too late, it's too fast. Then of course you can practice it with rhythms. You can use it as a very tight to observe your articulation and top speed, but in limited loop of few notes, three in this case, or perhaps more. Or these are up to you, but when you practice, you have to first practice hold and talk by intervals. Of course you can do it individually. And you realize uh, that 
that uh, the piece is written for uh, piano, obviously, but the pianos of Chopin's time, in comparison to today's grand pianos, don't have that depth of action, nor do they have that width of keys. I don't want to assume that it's because it's easier. That's not true. It was challenging already in the 1800s when he wrote the Etudes. But what it is, is that it was more agility, flexibility, precision, um, rather than power and uh, the power that demands to play deep in the action of the modern pianos who have crossed um, strings which allow for more resonance, who have um, um, steel um, strings which are more resistant to high power hitting of the hammer and therefore resonate more, and not to mention the iron cast which holds even more the pressure of the strings than the wooden would have done. So when you put together these elements, you realize that Chopin, when he was a student, he didn't study on his etudes, obviously. He studied on Czerny-type etudes, which are all to strengthen the hand, but in a certain way it becomes stiffer. Now, why do I insist on the palm support? Is because it allows to last by separating the intensity for the articulation from the muscular palm support strength that you practice little by little to become strong and supporting by doing a lot of hold and poke exercises. It doesn't happen overnight, obviously. But always monitor your wrist and listen to your body. Your body talks to you. It tells you don't hurt me. And when you're a child, you cheat easy because it doesn't mean to use them as much. You want to rather play if you're really driven, not so much practice. So thankfully, children don't do a lot of tendonitis, which is the plague for pianists who over practice, even a stiff arm and tendon possibility to compensate for the weakness of the hands, of the fingers from the palm. But it is important to take that in account because when you're a young adult, you're vulnerable because the expensive studies, um, you are responsible um, more than when you were a child and you feel also pressured. Deadlines, jury, recital, audition, exam. And you tell your body, I don't have time for you to complain, just do it. And that's when the vulnerable happens is that um, um, if you don't listen to and progress so that you can run first a kilometer, then more until you can run a marathon, the same way here, you have to do it progressively and intelligently and if possibly supervised in the practice room or in the practice home. Because ultimately the loneliness in the practicing of the pianist who accomplishes him or herself by their own solitary hours of repetitive practicing with or without exercises, hopefully the good ones for what helps their own morphology, after all is not one for all, but there are many aspects of the teaching it in order to organize the, how you handle it, literally. I find for piano technique that um, um, it's important to strengthen, uh, therefore, the capacity to play these uh, chords together, the notes of the chord. And why do I insist on their straightness? Is because the tip of the thumb and the tip of the fifth finger are equally short when they are vertical. And now two, three, and four could be straight, but tiny bit, let's say, diagonal sideways because most of the time they also play black keys. So if you have a black key on the fourth finger which is long, it's going to play earlier because it's earlier kicking it, hitting it, or playing it, striking it. Not more polite to say. Nobody hits, we strike. But the fact is, all semantics aside, that when you play the fourth finger on the higher key, because the black key is higher than the white, you have to have a very straight fifth finger to compensate, to avoid dropping the wrist if your fifth finger is bent or flat. And then you rise again, and that is recipe for unevenness. 
So yes, it's at several levels that you have to work on the winter wind um, technique. It's um, straight but not stiff fingers. Palm that espouses by its um, tips uh, visible um, uh, knuckles on top of the palm because they will have the different configuration for the different chordal dispositions that Chopin writes about. I believe very much in this approach where you teach your brain what your fingers should recognize and magnetically be attracted to so that in fact you extract the sounds of the piano. You don't, let's say, use the fingers to drop the sounds. You extract it from the Bintu, Bintu, and then you can divide the practicing with different rhythms for the top or the bottom. Or and then you can do it in rhythms with intervals by two or single. Keep in mind that the dynamic range is not forte for each of the sixteenth notes. Because that would be like this and it's going to hurt a lot. And besides it cannot last till the end of the piece. It is a combination of forte from different elements. The left hand... Naturally, it's not an etude for left-hand chordal melodic note chorale. That's not true. I know that some interpretations might become more that, like Cocteau in his um, um, 1930s, very for the time, original endeavor of um, um, work edition of the Chopin etudes with exercises and pages of explanations of what you need to reach and how you're going to reach it. And he speaks in the interpretation of the last etude of Opus um, 25 in C minor. He calls it the thumb chorale, the chorale of the thumb. So it could be also the chromatic descend of the weak fingers. If you play this softer, this louder, but both softer then because inevitably this is the chorale. So you can play the right hand mezzo piano. And have the forte in the chordal horns kind of three horn sound. Kind of a chorale with melody. And it's not all in the effect of the resonance, and it's not all in the effect of the dynamics, because it's really not meant, even if it's beautiful, to be an artistic piece per se, like the other etudes like lists. Though it is, because it's written by Chavin. And so that's why it's so important to practice it very um, disciplined. You don't jump stages until you reach the next stage of support suspension of the fingers from the palm and a relatively, perhaps not completely, but at least relatively flex, um, flexible wrist. And if you don't, you're going to hurt yourself. So the wise thing is to practice technique intensely with focused concentration on each of the repetitive patterns, which is by itself very difficult because you're by yourself and you have to be so driven in your conviction that you're going to go for the hours and hours Pigeon. 
you do 5 to 4 for E, B, D, Mi, Si, Re, and then you have to jump to play the thumb above 4, so 4 has to be straight, thumb has to be straight. Why? Because you maintain the wrist in the same position. If you drop for the thumb and you rise for the 4, you'll have <coughs> this gondola. You have to be linear. As I said, the wrist and the arm are like the bow. <coughs> and the left hand of the string instrument are the fingers from the palm up. Straight, not stiff. Support muscularly by practicing hold and, um, uh, hold and <coughs> poke. And um, always keep in mind that what you gained in a practice session <coughs> is as fragile as a sand castle on the beach. You cannot say, oh yeah, I practiced enough, now I know it is my muscular memory. Anytime I pull out my fingers, I'll just lay. It doesn't happen so. No matter how old you become, you have to always repractice these articulations because not only did Chopin create etudes to augment the flexibility and the precision of the fingers, but the flexibility of the hand, which was going in pairs with <coughs> the fact that when you play the piano, you are um, you're touching the keyboard. And that very word is very important. It's not just lifting from high and just... Because that's not helpful for the final solution when you're going to have to play it connected. When you play it in the tempo. So you have to play <coughs> under tempo with the position of in the tempo. And that is probably the most important part of the practicing. Because when it's under tempo, <coughs> You can use low wrist, up wrist. If Chopin wanted to practice here the, for you to gain more equality between chromatic stopping notes, dropping, <coughs> for the weakest fingers like 5-4, is that you wanted to strengthen your um, hands, your fingers projection, and <coughs> at the same time remain flexible in the hand. And I find that um, working on independence on fingers, like 5-4 with a common tendon, compared to 2-1 or 3-2, which are naturally with independent tendons. <coughs> so he works on both. He makes you improve your articulation of the right hand by strengthening the weak fingers and giving them a sense of practicing independence. Which is why I insisted to play softer the bottom notes of 2-1-1-2 two, one, one, two fingers. Or, or to one air, yeah. so that you don't have to force and nail, 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 nail <coughs> every of the notes. <coughs> Nobody should nail anything. It should be gliding with precision fingers and no wrist movement because it's not stiff. You don't need to lift to uh, relax it. And please, if in the beginning. It cannot reach a certain dynamic level that you hear in recordings <coughs> that you assume is the grand interpretation of the piece, which is true. It's a very effective loud piece, that's questionless. But in order to gain that strengthening, that precision, that dropping of the fingers for different combinations of keys according to the tonalities he uses, you have to uh, be more in precision than in weight or power. And little by little, the more you practice to uh, concentrate the essence of your articulation from the palm support, the louder it will be, but without you stiffening the wrist to obtain that. Not stiffening the wrist or the forearm or even the shoulder in order to keep the imprint of the notes from becoming... Well, obviously, that's a bit caricatural. But the point is, is that <clears throat> it demands assiduity, meaning um, uh, resentful, you, you, you stay on the case, you're focused, you observe your hands, and you make sure that all the gestures are fine-tuned for the disposition and the alternation of keys, white or black. 
so that little by little you teach in fact not your fingers of course you do through your fingers your muscular memory in the brain so that um, your cognitive um, awareness of this etude becomes a second nature and the fingers search naturally for their keys to play and the wrist doesn't have to compensate like a um, road bump for the suspensions of the car it has to remain in a position like a ball and not do this because if you play fast notes and you move the wrist it's recipe for unevenness no matter what you try <laughs> When Chopin works on the second etude in A minor, opus 10, it's a chromatic scale, but this time mostly rising, though also descending, but it is um, without broken intervals. In the first etude, it's about tenth, stretching and retracting to the third. He could have written... it doesn't make you progress. What makes you progress is to <clears throat> find the right disposition as if you memorize the very path of the fingers in terms of where in the keys they play on the edge or next to the black key or the black key itself. So you memorize the, the um, imprint of your fingers on the keyboard and you reproduce it by uh, muscular memory when you know it for a long time. I believe that the exercises are necessary because they bring you closer to controlling what for some innate reasons of uh, construction of our hand in terms of tendons and muscles and the and the unevenness of the fingers. And the reason that they're differently long is even more of an important thing when you want to play quick and fast and even all these notes. As Chopin asked, is that the bending happens to be at different levels because the fingers are different height. Third is tall, four is tall, second less, thumb and five are not, obviously. So, in order to give the illusion when you hear it that all these fingers are either vertical as if well, at least of course the thumb is originally meant to be as it is for most sections a horizontal finger clearly but in sections like this it has to become a vertical finger to equalize for the grip imprint for each of the chords ultimately what is the part of the morphology that touches the key which then reaches the hammer that hits the string, this action of the piano where you don't touch the string directly, of course, like harpists or string players, is that you have a tip of the each finger, the, the touching tip cushions of the fingers that touch the keys uh, with the final um, closest to the keys um, bending or uh, awareness of this knuckle on the tip because they want, they need and they should stay very precisely uh, like iron rivets but immediately above in terms of the palm, the wrist, you need to be flexible and you have to focus all your body extraction of the sound from the reposed shoulders, from the natural weight of the muscle and then the horizontal compared to the vertical forearm into the wrist and the palm in the same sometimes higher, mostly at the same, sometimes under but not above because it breaks the palm support and your fingers have no more leverage. Oh I know! All this is very easy to say in a few minutes and demonstrate and appear to be like um, hey, it's an easy recipe, all I have to do is do it. Well, that's the difference between theory and practicing it. And listening to your body tell you if you're reaching the precision, the dynamics, the velocity, the articulation, the lightness, the balance, the direction of the flow 
and at the same time the uh, resonance that you produce. So it's not about playing fast and loud the right hand, it's about playing it precise, agile, and the tips very, very, very stiff. But the tips, the finger is straight, in my opinion, not bent, for the reasons I explained earlier, for the topography of the terrain of the keyboard. And um, I find that if one doesn't apply such wise practicing, Acquiring the technique through the Chopin tube becomes almost a passport for a tendinitis, which is the biggest no-no in piano teaching. You don't want students to have tendinitis. It takes forever to come back to its natural shape when the tendons <coughs> are naturally duplicated by the um, nervous system and the, the glands, especially the pituitary gland. And so if you abuse them by practicing overly long and not listening to your body telling you that they feel tension or pain by telling them, hey, now it's the time, I have to be ready by a deadline that's where the exercises are necessary that's why I wrote these exercises for my students the open uh, augmented fifth, uh, full tone natural disposition of the hands according to the long ones on black keys and the short ones on the white keys. And Chopin was teaching through this um, augmented fifth method. Okay, that's theory, right? And now you apply it to the piece, which is chromatic, it's not full step, and it doesn't matter what it is, it's what it's supposed to be and you have to play it. So you have to teach your fingers to have anticipate. So each beat of um, four sixteenth notes, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, your muscular memory rolls around by being ahead, so that you can be precise, fast, agile, and at the same time um, um, correct, obviously, for the note. Now, of course, some action of pianos are heavier than others, I grant you. Some um, uh, grand pianos uh, resonate with less effort than others, I grant you that too. But generally speaking, yes, you can use it as a concert piece in a performance jury exam. It's because it's by Chopin, and it's because it's beautiful. But it's also dutiful, mostly. That's the purpose of it. So. Don't shortcut the progress of the articulation, of the strengthening, of the relaxation, of the position, of the direction, of the hands um, rotation, um, of the memorization of the different patterns. Because if you do that, then you will always reach a moment where you hit a wall. You have to have your muscular memory read at least a bit ahead to anticipate the disposition of the hand for each of the chords that are arpeggiated. And then you'll enjoy it all life long instead of having the feeling that it hurt you when you started it. <laughs>